As I say, we saw more action on the central bank front in Bank of England and also ECB this week. It surprised, I think, some people at least. What did it do to the bond market? Well, we finally saw uh, bonds go positive, first time in three years, right? So we, it, it definitely had an impact. I would say that the Bank of England is the one which I find fascinating. Definitely, the ECB moves larger pools of money when you see the, uh, see a major central bank uh, shift on a dime between December and now. December, probably no rate increases this year. Now, pretty clear we'll, we'll have a couple of rate increases, I'd say, later on this year. It's, it's a big change. If you look at the Bank of England, and that was a truly hawkish turn, because not only are we talking... You know, in the US, there's still open questions, and the market fully believes that when the Fed reduces the size of its balance sheet, it won't actively be selling down the balance sheet, which would be big, big news for the US. The, the UK, the Bank of England has made, uh, actually said that they might do that. That's very hawkish and very unexpected. And I always look at the Bank of England because it's so interesting. They have the liberty to move because it's a smaller country own currency. And I often look at them as a leading indicator of where potentially other major central banks could go. So something to keep uh, keep an eye on. Markets potentially have room to be majorly surprised and loads of volatility. Charmaine, uh, talk about the equity side, U.S. versus Europe, U.S. versus the rest of the world. How did it look in 2021? Is it going to look like that in 2022? We have been much more bullish on U.S. equities and have recommended that our clients actually overweight U.S. equities in their portfolios relative to market cap. And just to give you a sense of the magnitude of the difference in terms of U.S. and other parts of the world, since the trough of the global financial crisis, U.S. equities have returned about 760 percent. And we like to use cumulative numbers because we think it is just such a huge number. It has more impact when people hear the cumulative numbers. Developed equities outside the U.S. returned around, let's say, 260 percent, so roughly 500 percent lower returns. Emerging markets, a little bit less than that. And China, just 220 percent. So U.S. has far out-earned and outpaced in terms of returns the rest of the world. And last year what just was an incredible example of that. So last year, U.S. equities up just under 30 percent, let's say 29 non-U.S. developed equities around 20, emerging markets flat, and China down 21 percent. While that kind of a difference can't persist forever, as they say, trees do not grow to the skies, however, we do think U.S. will continue to out-earn other parts of the uh, world, other regions. And so even though they appear cheaper, we think some of that cheapness is just because of the sector exposure. The U.S. has a lot more earnings, for example, from technology and faster-growing sectors. They have less market cap weight in areas like energy and financials that are cheaper, while emerging markets and non-U.S. developed economies have more of that. So we still prefer our U.S. preeminence theme and recommend clients do that. And again, that's why that Coast Guard icebreaker is called USS Equities. And so now, what about on the bond side? Uh, given what's going on right now, does it make any sense, for example, to be owning European bonds, particularly sovereign bonds right now? I think, again, you've got to pick and choose. Your, the one thing about Europe, which is true, is there are different countries in Europe, different underlying fundamentals, and there's always going to, there will always be parts of Europe which look attractive at different points in time. And I think that as you start seeing yields go up in Europe, conversely, one of the anchors which kept, which people expected would keep U.S. 10 years from going up too high, which is that as the differential with Europe, with the Europe, uh, Eurozone kept increasing, you would see inflows into, into the US and thus the long end would stay anchored. That starts, that, that argument starts becoming a bit, bit weaker as you get some kind of normalization and it's going to be much slower. Let's, let, let's have that up front. Normalization in Europe will be a lot slower than the US. But on the other hand, I think it, again, points towards differences amongst the different countries. Charmaine, when you describe the really substantial difference between, for example, U.S. and Europe with respect to equities, I, I tend to think over the long term you can't have those kind of differentials. There's a sort of a law of osmosis in financial markets. Uh, does that suggest maybe it's time to actually go into some of the markets such as Europe because they are undervalued? <laughs> 
That is actually one of the questions our clients ask mm -hmm. us. So when you look at valuations across a series of metrics, U.S. Uh, is trading at a much higher premium relative to, again, emerging markets and non-U.S. developed. And clients are asking, isn't this time to go, given that it's much cheaper than even average levels? But first of all, we do adjust for sector weights, and it doesn't look as cheap. And as we project forward, U.S. trend growth is actually higher than that of, let's say, the Eurozone or Japan. So you'd expect better earnings growth. The other two really interesting facts are U.S. labor is a much more productive labor force, mm -hmm. and U.S. corporate management has much better uh, management scores. So actually, they get better earnings out of similar levels of growth. And so our view is that the earnings gap will continue, but the outperformance will not be as significant. So now we've had this whole discussion without once mentioning supply chains, which has been talked about an awful lot. Talk about supply chains, mm -hmm. and do you see a differential potential between the United States and Europe or the United States and Asia with respect to relief of some of the clogging of the supply chains? I'm not so sure we're going to see differences. On supply chains, I would actually say that uh, one thing which has really kept me uh, a little bit bemused is that when I look at the inflation uh, expectations for most of this year, second half of the year, you typically see a very sharp decline in expectations of where inflation will go, partly related to the idea that, you know, you've got base effects which fall out. But then also with this idea that supply chains are going to clear up. And I didn't, I really don't think supply chains follow calendar years. So I don't, I don't put much faith in that. The other thing I'd say is we haven't talked about this much, but and fortunately, it is only China, but China is committed to a zero COVID policy. Now, zero COVID is interesting because you can have completely very difficult to predict stops and starts to supply chains. And therefore, I remain a little bit skeptical about an easy, smooth unclogging of all the supply chains. That's one thing. Another point I would say, which is different to me between the US and certainly Europe, would be, that, uh, uh, would be that in the U.S. you've got very, very strong demand, right? right. We've got right. five-mile-long uh, right. queues mm -hmm. of boats. 